tonight, the title of the message is Losing My Religion. And if you're old school, that's a song. But tonight we're not talking about songs, we're talking about religion. We live in a works-based society. Most of you probably came from your, your job and your boss pretty much let you know that if you would like a paycheck, I need you to do A, B, C, and D. So if you'd like to get paid at the end of the week or in two weeks, I need you to do something in order to earn a paycheck. From the smallest of times when we were this big, your mother or father or grandparents said, if you clean your room, I'll give you a couple of dollars. If you take out the trash, I'll give you a, a little something. Basically, if you work at what I'm asking you to do, then I will reward you in some way, shape, or form. And all of us do this. So we're like, well, if I follow the rules, then basically something good's got to happen. If you have Allstate, if you don't get into an accident for a little while, they're going to give you some kind of money back for it. So they give you all of these incentives to follow the rules, to do good, to make sure everything goes according to this specific plan. And if you follow this plan to the T, at the end of this plan, we are going to give you something. So we live in this system that says, do this and you will attain this or you will get this. So I guess the next question is, what happens when your system runs smack dab into God's grace? What do you do when your works-based system of working to do, working to be, runs right into God's grace? Oh, God, I'm going to work. I'm going to do good. I'm not going to sin. I'm going to not do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do all of these things. Then we have God's grace that comes like this. So what do you do when your system of works in order to attain something no longer works? Well, tonight my prayer for all of us is that we would indeed lose our religion and find a relationship in Jesus. That we would lose our religion, our religiosity, but that we would find a relationship in Jesus. I like what this one author says. It says, religion is man's attempt to reach God. Christianity is God reaching man. I'm not sure what type of religious system you, you came from, but any system that's geared and built to reach God has a sets of do's and don'ts, sets of rules. And the problem is when we bring that, that type of mindset into our walk with God, we all know it can be like a roller coaster, right? Because when you're doing good, you're like, God is pleased with me. I didn't do anything wrong. Didn't get out of bed yet, but I didn't do anything wrong. You're driving to work, you, you make a mistake, or you say something you shouldn't have said, then all of a sudden there's this guilt that comes upon you that, oh, I've, I, I've done something wrong. Maybe I've, I've lost my salvation. Maybe God doesn't love me anymore. Has anybody ever been there? You made a mistake and you're, you're kind of questioning, I'm not sure if God can really love someone like me. What's happened? Your religious system runs right into grace because our religious system says I've got to do good do good do good do good do good then God will love me those of you that are parents you kind of understand this and unfortunately we get it kind of twisted around we encourage our kids to do good and when they do good what do we do we give them a hug we give them a kiss we give them high fives we give them a little pat but when they do bad restrictions right go to your room I was reading a story of this one dad learned of uh, his son did something really bad. And his son knew that his dad knew that he, do some, that he did something bad. Well, instead of punishing the son, the dad says, hey, let's go out for some ice cream. And the kid is like, what? I, I did something wrong. Why, why am I not being punished? It, it's God's grace. You see, God's grace doesn't punish us as soon as we do something wrong. Because it would be all the time, Right? For some of us, God's grace doesn't say, okay, he stepped out of line. Let me punish him right now. Let me send this little lightning bolt right now because they just stepped out of line. 
No, God's grace says, and God's mercy says, I am not going to give you what you do deserve. We deserve restrictions. We deserve all kinds of punishments. But God's love does not work on the same system that we are accustomed to. God's grace and mercy doesn't work on be good and then I'll give you this. Do good and you will attain to this. This is man's system. And tonight in our text, we will see the error of man's attempts to reach God, but we will also see God's love reaching to man. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to look at a couple of verses tonight. Philippians chapter 3, it's in the New Testament, back of your Bible, starting at verse 1, says this. It says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. Verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I the more also circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. What we first learn tonight, Paul's given us a reminder in that it's good. He's talking to the Philippian church and he's saying, brethren, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. I want you to be mindful that although you're going through a really difficult time, I want to remind you to, to rejoice. Does anybody ever use any of, uh, any of these around your office or around, uh, around the home? They're called stickies and post-its. I have stickies and post-its everywhere. I even have them with me tonight. I keep these all in my, my folder that I, that I preach from because it reminds me. It reminds me that this one brother said, God is good, Henry, and I'm praying for you. It also reminds me of a quote that John MacArthur said. He said, the power is in the word, the truth that we preach, and not in us. Because we need the reminders that it's about God, that it's not about us, that we need to rejoice. And sometimes we're going through a difficult time in life and our heads are kind of down, our countenance is kind of down. Isn't it okay for us to come along and say, rejoice, things are going to work out. Things are going to be okay. And then we kind of say, you know what? Things are going to be okay. I need to rejoice. Personally, today, I needed to hear, you need to rejoice, Henry, because it's been a little challenging. But reading God's word, I should rejoice during these times when things aren't working right. We can still rejoice in Christ Jesus. And why can we rejoice? Because God loves us. God cares about us. That God gave us Jesus Christ we need these reminders that it's important to rejoice. God gives us a few reminders in his word. He says, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever, what? Shout. When was the last time you let out a little shout to God? I know we're not too Pentecostal in here, but when was the last time you just said, hey, man. Amen. Hallelujah. It says, because you defend them. It says, let those also who love your name be joyful in you, because it's by the name of Jesus Christ that we have been set free. It's by the name of Jesus Christ that we have hope, and it's good to be reminded, brother, sister, you might be going through some stuff, some tough stuff, some stuff you're kind of working out, some really difficult stuff, but I want to encourage you, rejoice in the Lord, because what we don't want to do is we don't want to just rejoice in God when things are going great, when we just got paid when we're not sick. We want to be consistent. God, I want to rejoice in you whether things aren't going so good or whether things are going good because my love for you, God, is not based on conditions. If you bless me, God, you're a wonderful God. But if things go wrong and my health goes wrong, then, eh, God, what's happened? What's wrong? Maybe you're not this big and great, powerful God, but we know that he is. So Paul reminds the church to, brethren, rejoice. But reminders also serve 
as warnings. Warnings are, are pretty good. I like warnings of when uh, I'm coming home and there's no lights on and there's stuff on the floor. By the way, watch your toes. There might be some stuff that you're going to run into. I like warnings of, hey, don't delete this one video. I like warnings of, give me a second, but the floor is still wet. Anybody ever be surprised by some, some wet floor? Woo! I love warnings that say, be careful, slow down. And the Apostle Paul is saying the same thing to this church at Philippi. Let me give you a few warnings. Now, if you love somebody, you're going to warn them of what's to come. If you love somebody, if you see something on the horizon, you might say, hey, better, better put some air in that front tire because it's, it's a little low. Or, you know what, it looks like it's going to rain today. Go take an umbrella. Well, this warning that Paul gives is a little more serious than that because he loves them and he cares for them. He says this in verse 2. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. Well, what does Paul mean here? Beware of dogs and evil workers. What does this mean, of the, the mutilation? Paul is addressing false teachers and their distortion of the gospel, that salvation was not in Jesus alone. So these Judaizers came into the, the church when Paul wasn't there, and they were saying, you know what? Yeah, we know that Paul talked to you about just having faith in Jesus alone, but no, you've got to do these other works in order to be righteous, in order to be saved. Let's talk about these for a second. Paul says, beware of dogs. During this time in the eastern cities, dogs just ran free. They were in the trash. They were harassing people. They were scavenging. They were fighting. They were biting people. This is symbolic of the religiousness of these Judaizers, these Pharisees that said, in order to know Jesus, you had to do a certain set of, of rules and regulations. And Paul is warning the church about this. They're called having legalism. We have any legalist people in here? I'm sure there's some sprinkled around. No hand raise in there, huh? Those, the legalists will say, you know what? In order to be religious, in order to be spiritual, well, you have to do this and this and this. And, and once you do these three things, then you're going to be spiritual. It's like me saying, if you have a TV in your home, there's no way you're a Christian. People do that. If you have drums in your church, you're not the true church. If you come to church dressed like this, then you're probably not saved. If you go to the movies, you don't know God. How can you go to the movies and, and have a relationship with God? And those of you that are old school, that's exactly what your parents told you, right? You couldn't go to the movies, right? Because no Christian goes to the movies. Personally, I think ESPN is the greatest thing that has been created in 50, 60 years. So how can someone say that if you, if you watch TV, that it's a bad thing, that it's not a, a God-pleasing thing? When we say that you can't do this and we can't do that, what we are actually doing is we're trying to fit people into our own little box. Well, don't wear that. Don't do this. Don't talk like that. Don't listen to this. Don't go here. Don't do that. That's all legalism. Where do we read about it in the Bible that thou shalt not go dancing? Nowhere. Thou shalt not have any music in your church. Nowhere do we find this in the Bible. But what we have done is we've taken a little bit of truth and we've created our own reality. So I want you to be just like me. So if you send your kids to public school, you're not saved. You need to homeschool your kids. People say that. Go online. If you just... Do what we're doing because we're doing it the right way. If, you're, if your dress doesn't touch your ankles, then you shouldn't be here at church. This is what people say. These legalists, and Paul is saying, beware of people like this. He goes on to say, beware of evil workers, those who pervert the gospel, those who are teaching that righteousness only comes by observing the law, that we are not justified by faith alone, but we are justified by faith alone. And that word justification means God has made it just as if we have never sinned when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Bible says. Jesus says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They come in and just give a little bit of, are you sure that that's what you should be doing? 
mm, yeah, you know what? You should be working. You should be doing more for the Lord. And some of you have that, that mentality that I've got to be doing something for God or just maybe God doesn't love me. That if I'm not working at doing something, if I'm not giving it 100%, if I'm not perfect, maybe God doesn't love me. That you come from a background that you had to work for something, that you had to work for approval. This is not so with Christianity and Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say, beware of the mutilation. This is a reference to a group of people that were saying in order to be truly saved, you had to be circumcised. That in order to truly know Jesus, in order to be a believer, you had to be circumcised. Now, the Philippian church were Gentiles. So these Judaizers were, Judaizers were saying, in order to be like us, you have to observe the law. You have to look like us. You have to be like us. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17, and we're going to look at this little closer. First book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 17. And as you're turning there, we're going to talk about a covenant that God made with Abram. Genesis chapter 17, we're going to look at verses 5 through 11. This is God making a covenant with Abram. Genesis chapter 17, starting at verse 5, says this. God says, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I, and I'll make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said, said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Keep your place there. Don't turn it yet. So you see, God established a covenant with Abraham that every male would be circumcised. And Abraham is called the father of faith. But as we just read, there is nowhere here in this covenant where it said, Abraham, if you do this, you will be righteous. You will be in good standing with me if you do this. And here is where the Jewish religion says, you must do all of these things. You must observe all of these things in order to be in right standing with God. Here's what I uh, looked at this week online regarding the Torah and how to achieve uh, closeness with God. It was Torah.org, I believe. It says, the greatest question of them all is, what is the purpose of life? The Torah explains that the purpose of human existence is to achieve closeness to God. This is attained via living in accordance with the 613 commandments. Let's stop there. What? 613 things not to do. Oh my goodness. That's, that is just out there. We have 10 and we can't do 10. They said, you know what, let's just multiply that exponentially. Let's just make 600 more and add on 13 and just maybe we'll keep the 10. And this is real stuff. This is this is life, 613 commandments. It says, because each uh, mitzvah in its own unique way contains the means for man to forge a relationship with God. They're saying if you keep this 613 commandments, then you and God are going to be like this. Maybe that's why them and God aren't like this. That's why nobody in God can be like 613 things to to keep and to do. This was the mindset. So I guess the million dollar question is, how did someone in the Old Testament become righteous in God's sight? 
the same way they do in the New Testament. Turn left in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 will give us the answer to the question of how do we become righteous in God's eyes? Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, says this. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram, but Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And what's our answer to this question? Verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This was before being circumcised. This was before the covenant that God made with Abraham. So when he was still Abram, God says, hey, come outside. Let me show you something. Look at all that if you can count it. Your descendants will be just like that. Abram said, okay. That's it, right? He didn't do anything. He didn't work at anything. He simply believed God, and God said, you're righteous. He, didn't, he wasn't circumcised at that time. He didn't do any works. He didn't do any sacrifices. He simply believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what does that mean for us? We're to follow Abraham, Abraham's pattern. Simply believe God. There's no works that were involved. He simply believed what God had told him, and because of that, he was made righteous in God's sight, not just uh, by observing the law. Deuteronomy tells us, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. God is not concerned, family and friends, with our outward motions, our outward workings to, to earn anything. God is not concerned about that. God is concerned about what's going on in here. Because right here could look really, really good. You're praising the Lord. Things are going great. But God is concerned about what's in your heart. We can do all of the outward things, and it may look good to us. We're like, wow, that brother is here all the time. That sister is here all the time. They're in prayer meetings. They're doing all of these great things. Wow. God is going, let me get my little flashlight and look and see what's really going on, going on here. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it to earn somehow God's approval? So is your faith placed in your attempts at being perfect? Or is your faith placed in what Jesus has done? Because no matter how good you are, your best day, we still fall short of God's goodness, of God's grace. And God's not like us. When someone fails us, what do we do? We delete them from Facebook or something like that, right? Someone gets mad at us or something, you know, we hit delete or you unfriend them, right? They'll never know. You do all of these things when someone fails us. But what does God do when we fail him? Does he all of a sudden put us on mute where he doesn't hear our prayers? Does he all of a sudden, you know, not bless us anymore? Does God do things like that? I don't think God does anything like that because God is not like us. God's system is not like our system of of, pro of approval, of working and trying, God's system, if we want to call it that, is just Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus. Jesus is the one that loves you, that cares for you, and I'm actually represented in Jesus. So we can have hope and peace knowing that God is not walking around always being disappointed in us. Think about this. How can God be disappointed in us if he has seen our entire lives already lived out? Your mistakes aren't a surprise to God. God's not going to say, whoa, I didn't see that coming. I can't believe they just did that. God is not surprised by you, by your failures, by your mistakes. You might be surprised that you did that. You might be saying, man, I can't believe I just did that. But God is not that way. God is not disappointed by our failures. 
Because that's what Jesus Christ came to, to do. Jesus Christ came to, to wash away all of our mistakes and all of our sins and all of our issues. But do you believe that? Because some of you, when you stumble and you fall, you lay on the ground and just murmur for like weeks, wondering, does God still love me after what I just did? What kind of question is that? That type of question means you need to know Jesus better. You see, there's a difference between knowing of Jesus and knowing him. When we know him, it's not like, well, God, if you can forgive me. God, if you want to show me some mercy, that's people that know of God. But when you know Jesus, Jesus, your word says, 1 John 1, 9, that if I confess my sins before you, you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Help me, Jesus. Amen. And it's done. But if you don't know who God is, you're on the ground going, oh, no, God doesn't love me. I'm horrible. God, how, God, I, Help me, God. I, I want to please you. I want to do what's right in your eyes. I, I want you to love me. Can you imagine one of your kids coming to you and saying, Mom or Dad, what can I do so you can love me more? You would probably cry, wouldn't you? What can, I, I, I gave birth to you. What can you do so I can love you more? Son, daughter, there's nothing you can do for me to love you more. I love you just as you are. And my prayer tonight is that all of you would know that God loves you just as you are. A little messed up, going the wrong way sometimes, purposely doing the wrong thing sometimes, without faith sometimes, being mean to each other sometimes, having bad thoughts sometimes. God loves all of you. God doesn't say, I just love the, the good part of you, because newsflash, there's not a good part. Because without Jesus, it's all bad. So God just loved this part of me, this part that I, I've mastered this part, God. No, God loves us in totality. And it's so important that we understand what God is saying, that it's all about Jesus Christ, not about our works. So we have the Apostle Paul warning the people at Philippi, but we're also going to get to a point where we're going to see that there is a difference. In verse 3, Paul says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Paul says, we are the true circumcision. We are the new creations in Jesus Christ. You have these Judaizers that said, hey, we are of the circumcision. You know, we're... We're Jews. But Paul says, no, no, no. We are the circumcision. Listen to what Galatians 6.15 says. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Because God is not concerned about the outward man. God is only concerned with the inward man. So adhering to the law, trying to be good, will only get you so far in human eyes in human terms, but not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. J. Bernie McGee puts it this way, God is not looking for a mere external observance. God, I'm, I'm here. Look what I'm doing. God, love me. I'm here. J. Bernie says, God is not really looking for that. I guess the question is, are we offering God just external motions? Are we just going through the motions in our walk with God, are we actively worshiping him? Paul goes on and he says that we, need, we worship God in the spirit. Worship is not just raising of hands and singing a song, but it is a lifestyle. And what I love during times of worship in, in the back, and it's great to see some of you raising your hands and you're, you're worshiping God. You're, you're, you're hearing these song lyrics, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and worship his holy, his holy name. We have these 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. As you're singing, you're, you're praising the Lord, you're giving God worship. You're saying, God, I love you. Thank you for, for caring about me. It's this outflow that's coming from your heart unto God. It's not simply just an outward, hey, God, I'm raising my hands. It's a, God, I love you. 
God, praise you for, for rescuing me and thank you that my heart knows you too well, that you've redeemed me and washed me, that I can stand in front of you and I'm clean. So it's like your heart is, is causing everything in you to just raise your hands and say, God, I agree. So we worship God in spirit. John tells us it like this. He says, but the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And I love this part. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. That it's not just about our outward observances, but it's that we are empowered by his Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, rejoice in Christ Jesus. Our rejoicing isn't a rejoicing over accomplishments or works or observances, but our rejoicing is in Jesus Christ. Is it hard for us to, to feel God's approval when, we're, when we messed up? Or is it hard for us to, to feel God's approval when we're just resting in Jesus? I mean, are we nervous that just maybe God might find something in us that would mean that he wouldn't love us? I wonder if it's difficult for us just to simply rest. God, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I believe in Jesus. Come and save me. Do we rest in that? Or do we feel we have to keep cleaning our room, that we have to keep doing the right things in order that God would, would love us? I wonder if God just wants us to rest in the work of the cross, it, rest in the work of what Jesus Christ has done. Have we tried to clean up ourselves before? A few of us. God, I'm going to make a better effort to stop doing this. It lasts for, what, a good two weeks, maybe? How'd your diet go after maybe February? Those of you that didn't want to eat bread, you're like, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. No more bread. No more carbs. First day, you're like, okay, I can do this. I can kick this thing. You're taking your own lunch to work. Your friends are eating breads and all of this, and you're just doing your salad. Things are good, right? But then somewhere along your journey, you saw some of that bread from like Olive Garden with the butter brushed on top of it, <laughs> with the salt sprinkled. Everyone else was just eating and talking, and you're just salivating, right? I, I got the willpower. I can do it. No bread. No bread. Bread was gone. The waitress said, should I bring some more bread to the table? Yes, you should. <laughs> your willpower only lasted for just a little bit of time. So ask yourself, are you resting in what Jesus has done to forgive you? Or are you trying to get that willpower that I'm not going to mess up today? Do you wake up saying, I'm not going to mess up today? <laughs> I'm not going to sin today. That's my goal. God, I'm going to please you today by not messing up. What kind of joy is that? That's pressure. If you're waking up saying, okay, God, help me to not mess up today. Your day is already shot. <laughs> you're done with a prayer like that. Help me to not mess up today. It's called life, family. It's, it's filled with stumbles and falls and, and, and bruises and bleeding and crying and snot running. It's, it's filled with difficulties. So if we're asking God, help me to not mess up today, I wonder if God says, D do you not rejoice in the cross? Do you not rejoice in, in Christ Jesus? Have you not rested in what my son has done? And I think that's our problem. We either don't believe that the cross was enough, or we think we can do a better job. And we know we can't do a better job at saving ourselves. So why is the cross not enough for you? Why isn't what Jesus Christ has done enough for you? Why isn't it enough for you for you to wake up and say, God, I love you. Be with me all day. Let's do this thing today. If that's not enough for you, you're working. You're working at God's approval. When God just wants us just to rest God, you know, the, the psalmist says, God, you know me. That means you know everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. God, you know, you've searched me, and you know me. Rest in the fact that God knows all those little secrets that no one else knows, those hidden skeletons and those hidden bones. God knows all of that, and guess what? 
he still chose to keep that heart switch button going today. He says, oh my, but let's keep them going because I'm long-suffering. I'm filled with grace and mercy. So we must rest in what Jesus Christ has done. And it's so hard for us to just rest in, in the cross, rest in the work, the finished work of the cross. When Jesus was on the cross, he says, it is finished to tell us I that there's nothing else that needs to be done. I've fixed everything. It's good. I'm done. But somehow we come along and say, well, I need to do this one thing. I need to keep doing this because I can't just simply believe that Jesus has set me free. I simply can't believe that he died on the cross for me. Thus, you wake up in the morning saying, help me to not, to not do wrong. And do you know what I'm saying? Obviously, we're going to do wrong. But if your mentality is, God, I need to do something in order to get something, that's wrong. That's why you're walking around sad with these bricks on your shoulders because it's an approval system with you. You've brought that works-based system into a relationship that it doesn't belong. Think about that. It's like if, if, you, if you're with somebody, a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend, tell me what I can do to, to love you more. They're like, just be who you are. Just be who you are. I wonder if God just wants us to be who we are, do our best, and love Jesus. I want to wake up tomorrow morning and saying, God, I love you to death. Thank you for giving me Jesus Christ. You've changed me. You've set me free. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between us. You already know what's going to happen. I just want to worship through it. I just want to do my best when I come to a fork, of the, fork in the road. Do I sin or do I trust God? God, you know I'm going to do my best to trust you. I may start inching this way, God, but help me to pray to you. Help me to ask you for strength. Because if, I'm simply, because if I'm simply saying, God, I just don't want to fail you again today. Really? Is that the kind of relationship that God wants us to have with him? That we are afraid of failing him? Because newsflash, we have already failed him. But he's given us Jesus Christ. So it's like a graded paper, all these red stuff going on, X's and minuses and all of this. God already knows all of that. So he says, okay, let me take that and let me give you an A. Let me take all of these red marks, all of these failures, all of these miscommunications, these miscalculations, and let me give you an A because Jesus Christ has done your homework for you. Jesus is the one that has made everything okay for you. So you are not graded on a curve. You are simply graded by believing in Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is trying to warn this Philippian believers that it's not about doing all of these works. It's not about circumcision. It's not about adhering to the law. It's not about doing your best. It's about trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear me tonight. If you hear nothing else, it's about Jesus and not about you. It's not about what you have done. It's not about your, your stumblings and your failings. It's about what God has already done. And I want to encourage you with this. Once you get that in here and in here, it's not about passing or failing. It's about trusting in Jesus Christ with your life. And once you've trusted him with your life, he already knows tomorrow. Let me just help you out. I'm not a prophet, but let me prophesy. Tomorrow, all of us are going to sin. Take the pill, swallow it, it's going to happen. Right? But guess what? God's already seen all of that. And you know what? I believe that tomorrow when you wake up, he's still going to love you. So let's do this. When you wake up tomorrow morning, before your feet hit the floor, God, I love you. Thank you for loving me. Thanks for taking care of me. Before I start my day, I just want to give it to you. Before I do anything, I just want to give you my day because I love you. I care for you. Thank you for what you're doing in, in my life, in and through me, and start your day. When we go this way, God... I'm off path, let me get back on path. But it's not about rules and regulations. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So those of you that are misunderstanding me that you don't have to do anything, that is correct. Faith in Jesus Christ and him alone equals salvation. We are righteous in God's standards because we place our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's it. In its totality, 
that's it. So when we get up to heaven and God says, hey, why should I let you into my heaven? Oh, God, well, I was a pastor and I did this, I fixed this, and I did all of these things. You know, I was working for you, God. Oh, that's not going to really work here. That may have looked good down there, but all your works and stuff doesn't mean anything up here because there's someone that's here that has put in the work. And it wasn't you because there's no nails in your hands. There's no wound in the side. There's no nails in your feet. So you can't be him. So all of your works are as filthy rags. It's like going up to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I see your, your nail prints and all of this, but let me work for you to love me here. What about this? Can I do this? Do you love me now? Is, is this okay? Is this adequate for you to love me? He says, hey, this is, this is unconditional love. Take that stuff away from me. I don't want your, your little works. I want this. I want your heart. So if you're here tonight and, and maybe you've come from a, a system of works and do's and don'ts and all of these things, or if that's still kind of part of you, you've got to leave that at the cross tonight. You've got to leave that and say, God, no longer am I going to work for your approval. Am I going to work for you to love me? Because God will never love you any more than he does right now. And next week we're going to talk about other stuff, but God is concerned with this right here, not about these things, what you can do for him. He's more concerned with this, not all of our external workings to merit God's approval. Amen?